All right, awesome. So first of all, uh, thanks for having me here today, guys. Uh, my name is James Denton, and I'm a principal architect at Rackspace Technology. We're based out of San Antonio, Texas. I've been involved with OpenStack for the last 10 plus years, primarily in the private cloud space and especially scope to networking, both physical and virtual. Um, so today I want to share with you some experiences in using Bifrost to perform remote server provisioning, which is the ability to deploy an operating system against a set of nodes across a VPN tunnel with no local Pixie or DHCP server or provisioning system in place. Um, a little disclaimer, I'm a master of inefficiency. Uh, I learned some of these tools just enough to perform a POC. And uh, so if you see anything here that looks, you know, inefficient or wrong, uh, feel free to, you know, bring it up in the Q&A afterwards. I'm, I'm always soliciting advice. All right. So uh, for those that aren't familiar with it, Bifrost was introduced around the Mataka timeframe and is a sub project of the Ironic project, which is the service responsible for bare metal provisioning. It's a collection of playbooks that can install what is essentially ironic light, uh, as well as handle enrollment and deployment of bare metal instances in an automated fashion. So with Bifrost, the ironic bits are completely decoupled from the rest of the OpenStack stack, save so, for some optional integrations with Keystone and possibly other services. Uh, so here at Rackspace, we're just dipping our toes into the Bifrost waters after having run ironic for many years now as part of our on metal offering in public cloud, as well as our private cloud offerings based on OpenStack Ansible and Red Hat OSP. So where Bifrost is really useful for me uh, is its ability to answer the question of how do I bootstrap the node that bootstraps the nodes? Uh, so whether it's one or 100, Bifrost does seem to be up to the task. And really because it is ironic under the hood, I don't think that's any surprise. Uh, coupled with some additional automation, you can find yourself standing up an environment in relatively short order if you've taken the time to develop an inventory and a strategy, and we'll kind of go into that a little bit later. Uh, traditionally, in a remote environment, uh, the bootstrapping process consists of a deployment engineer with an ISO and a few days or weeks on site uh, or remotely to handle the operating system install and network configuration. Uh, so, or in some cases, uh, the vendor might be asked to deploy the operating system and basic network config before the servers are even shipped. So tools like Bifrost, Ironic, and even, you know, Canonical NAS, if we can say those words, um, help bring a cloud-like deployment strategy to bare metal. So for the rest of my time here today, I'll share with you some basic steps of getting started with Bifrost, as well as how to cover how we are using it to deploy bare metal nodes across the United States. The uh, hub and stoke, uh, sorry, a hub and spoke IPsec VPN with no changes to Bifrost and some limited changes to DNA, DNS mask. So before we can actually proceed with the installation of Bifrost, one must know their environment, uh, as some of those details are required as part of the installation and deployment process. Pictured here uh, is a remote deployment in a data center in Dallas, Texas consisting of an edge firewall and a handful of bare metal servers connected to some local switching infrastructure. The use case we're solving for here is the ability to bootstrap this particular environment using ironic based infrastructure located in another DC. The R740 uh, that's pictured here has a dedicated Pixie interface on ENO2, which is the one gig interface on that two port, two port NIC. In addition, there's a single two by 10, two by 10 gig bond uh, for production traffic, they may or may not use that same Cisco ASA. But for the purpose of Bifrost and Ironic in particular, we only really care about that, that Pixie interface. In lieu of the DHCP server that would exist in the same local VLAN as this Pixie client, uh, our Cisco ASA is going to act as a DHCP relay. So it's going to forward all of the Pixie and DHCP requests across the VPN tunnel that exists in the other data center. So in what we'll call the centralized Chicago data center, Bifrost is hosted on a virtual machine that's dual homed. One network interface is used for the management of the Bifrost VM itself, and the other network interface will be used for Pixie and DHCP client requests coming over the VPN. The, uh, the former is the black line named external. The DHCP interface is the red one named PX, uh, Pixie Relay. 
The management interface not only used to reach the Bifrost host itself for management, but to allow that host to reach out and tickle the out of band interfaces of the bare metal hosts for power on and reboot commands. In our environments, out of band networks are truly out of band, but for some remote environments, it might be reachable via the same VPN tunnel. As long as it's reachable from this Bifrost host, whether it's local or routed, Ironic will be happy. Since we intend on these Pixie clients to hit the backside interface of this Bifrost VM, static routes or some policy-based routing rules are necessary to ensure that the response traffic is actually sent back out the same interface it came and towards the ASA and back over the VPN. So in this example, uh, the clients will source from DFW from the 192.168.192.0.25 CIDR over the DHCP relay and over the tunnel. And the DNS mask on this Bifrost host will respond accordingly. So to summarize, we have these two data centers, DFW and ORD, and they're linked by an IP6 site-to-site VB tunnel between two Cisco ASA firewalls. Everybody with me so far? All right, so now that we know what the environment looks like, let's take a look at how to install Bifrost. So the installation of Bifrost can occur in one of two ways, either the Bifrost command line client or viable, uh, sorry, via the Ansible playbooks. Both of these options are available from within the Bifrost repo and the documentation upstream kind of gives you some more guidance on using the CLI versus the playbooks. But the takeaway here is that um, those playbooks are totally customizable and you can integrate them into whatever system you deem necessary. But in either case, you're going to need to know your environment, which at a minimum includes the DHCP address pool for handing out addresses to the bare metal node seeking leases, as well as the network interface on the Bifrost node used to respond to those requests. So in the DFW environment, the bare metal hosts uh, Pixie network is 192.168.192.25. The gateway device is a Cisco ASA with a dot one address. The DHC people can be a subset of that slash 25. Uh, and then the hosts themselves can have static IP assignments from the rest of that site or once provisioned. So it's important to remember that none of these addresses are actually local to the Bifrost host or to that ORD environment. They'll all be routable and reachable over the VPN tunnel. Um, pictured here, I've done myself a favor and made myself a small bash script that takes some of the environment variables and inputs them as overrides for the installation playbooks, namely the ability to define which version of Bifrost I want to install in the network interface. Um, I have chosen here to deploy stable, you know, the antelope version of, of Bifrost, but sometimes there are bugs, which in testing I had to revert to Zed, uh, kind of avoided master for reasons. Um, but once once this installation is complete, you can run bare metal commands against the Bifrost cloud defined in clouds.yaml, which is actually installed by the playbooks. And this is essentially the the Python I'm sorry, the Python ironic client decoupled from the OpenStack client. So the installation of Bifrost installs and configures a, a core set of services, including ironic API and conductor. Ironic Inspector, DNS Math, MariaDB, and Nginx. DNS Math serves an important role here as the DHCP server and the TFTP server, directing those clients to download the initial RAM disk or the VPN. The Ansible playbooks are responsible for configuring all of these components, so care should be taken to avoid changing configuration files manually, lest they be overwritten on a subsequent playbook run. The exception to this, however, is DNS Math as there are some changes necessary to facilitate the DHCP relay we've implemented. Thankfully, uh, DNS mask does allow for the use of additional configuration files in a, in like a conf.d folder that won't be overwritten by Ansible, but actually get aggregated with all of the other configuration files. And we'll kind of demonstrate that in a few minutes. Um, a quick glance at this ironic.com file shows that it references the local host and directs clients to itself for the download of the RAM disk and some of the other necessary components. Uh, and then we can see here from MariaDB, it really is limited to just the ironic related databases. So none of the OpenStack components are installed.
Uh, in leveraging a separate DNS mask configuration file that won't be overwritten by the playbooks, we can define multiple sites that will be serviced by this Bifrost host via multiple VPN tunnels using tagging. So here we have the DFW site defined as well as a site in Hong Kong. Every additional environment we want serviced by this particular Bifrost instance needs these options with a unique IP space and appropriate routes in place on the host. A separate Bifrost host can be used per site as well for further segregation and customizations. But ideally, this particular Bifrost host could service, you know, 30 different data centers in a hub and spoke VPN, as long as each of these configuration options are, are listed for those uh, individual sites. So whenever you perform like a bare metal server list or bare metal node list, you'll see all of the nodes sort of intermingled. Once Bifrost is installed, the next step in the journey is to enroll the nodes. The enrollment process uh, includes creating the nodes within Ironic and defining various properties, such as the out-of-band addresses and credentials, image locations, and more. The images need not be local to either environment. And in fact, we've uploaded them to our Swift-based object storage system node as cloud files for easy access. In the DFW environment, we're working with an HP ProLiant Gen 9 and have defined the out-of-band address, credentials, host name, and MAC address of the Pixie interface. When enrolling the node via Bifrost playbooks, these properties are defined in an inventory file, like shown, and uh, are used to create the bare metal node within Ironic and configure such properties as driver info, driver, and auth info. Upon enrollment, the node may be cleaned automatically, depending on the configuration, and may sit awaiting ne the next command. Bifrost can even be configured to inspect the node upon enrollment, uh, and that resulting information can then help the operators be a little bit more explicit on the deployment details we'll see in the next step. Enrolling the node uh, is as easy as using the Bifrost CLI command, as long with the uh, aforementioned inventory file, which then triggers Ansible to perform the enrollment tasks. And once complete, the node's available for deployment. So here we have an inventory that I've created uh, that's for a particular storage node, but you can actually have an inventory of 100 nodes and it will actually enroll them all at once. So for every task, you'll just see it repeated for each individual node. To deploy a bare metal node, uh, the Bifrost CLI command will be used to deploy, I'm sorry, with the deploy directive to deploy against the node specified in the inventory file. You can either target a single node or an entire environment for enrollment or deployment based on that inventory. But the, the throughput may be limited if you do a bunch at once, especially over this VPN, because remember the RAM disk and the kernel are being shipped over the VPN tunnel. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the root device hints are really helpful as it allows Ironic to target a particular hard drive to deploy the image onto in case you have multiple disks. So this being a storage node, it's got uh, a RAID 10, for the boot disk and then a bunch of RAID zeros for all of the, the storage uh, disks for like Ceph. So doing the inventory allowed me to identify how those disks were identified by, um, I, you know, Ironic. And then I can update the root device hint to make sure I target the, uh, the RAID 10. For the sake of time, uh, pre-recorded a bare metal deployment process that I'll just kick off real quick. Um, once the Pixie process begins, the RAM disk and the kernel are downloaded from the Bifrost host via the VPN. It takes approximately three minutes to copy the bare metal image to disk, which includes downloading the image from object storage before the node is rebooted. And then the remaining seven minutes in typical HP fashion is the uh, pre-boot and boot process. So here, as we look at this, we can see that this 192.168.192.239 port 8080 is actually the IP address of our um, Bifrost node. Uh, and that's IP, I'm sorry, uh, PFTP, and uh, in this case, HTTP hosting that IPixie file. So we're downloading the RAM disk right now. It will boot, and then the Ironic Python agent kicks off and starts doing its job and will download the image from cloud files. I'll speed this up a little bit. 
So if you're familiar with ironic, this is ironic, right? So it's doing the same thing that uh, it would do on a, on a typical ironic deployment. And as we get a little bit closer to the three minute mark, um, we'll see ironic, um, well, we'll see the, the shutdown process start to begin. There we go. And then a reboot will occur and then the node will come back. Sorry. What I really want to show you is uh, our node is now up after about 10 minutes and we have a host name set here. So that host name uh, is provided by the metadata and user data of this particular host, which is provided by um, a config drive that is actually a partition on the hard disk and cloud init in this cloud image you know pulls the relevant metadata out so let's revisit that earlier diagram and take a look at the high level process being followed once the deploy is triggered bifrost and ord tickles the bare metal node in dfw via its out-of-band interface and powers on the device the bare metal node, which is then set to boot from the network, initiates a DHCP request. And that DHCP request is relayed over the VPN tunnel to the Bifrost VM, and a response is sent back. The bare metal node boots from the RAM disk indicated in the DHCP response, and then the IPA copies the cloud image to disk and reboots the node. Yep, and when once the server is rebooted, CloudNet will gather that user data from the attached config drive and a basic network configuration is applied. So that IP address that we actually defined in the inventory as IPv4 underscore address is what's configured on ENO2 upon reboot. The, uh, the RSA key that was provided as part of the inventory is also used on this host. So I can SSH from that Bifrost VM as long as that routing is in place and access this device. So user data can be leveraged to provide additional configs and commands uh, that can be executed by CloudInit, including NetPlan, uh, Bash scripts, and others. Uh, for our purposes, this base connectivity is sufficient enough to allow us to run additional Ansible playbooks that will set up networking bridges, bonds, and other IPs to stage the node for an eventual OpenStack deployment. And by leveraging that other set of custom playbooks, we can we can prescribe specific network configuration details for each node that will eventually be kicked by Ironic. Uh, we leverage the Ansible NetPlan role and, and apply a very specific NetPlan configuration that fits our OpenStack Ansible deployment model, along with all of the individual IP addresses and routes that are needed to facilitate that. So once I run those custom playbooks against the uh, IP on ENO2, we can log back into the machine and see all of our routes have been updated. And now uh, if I ping, you know, Google's DNS server, it's actually leaving the, the bonded interfaces and, and not the, uh, the Pixie interface. So um, the use of Bifrost has considerably simplified the process of provisioning remote deployments by not requiring a full blown OpenStack or Ironic deployment or any other provisioning system on site. And simply relying on IPsec, uh, you know, standard IPsec VPNs and the DHCP relay functionality, we can theoretically stand up an entire environment in about 30 minutes, minus any cabling or other issues. Uh, so the, the takeaway here is really knowing your environment beforehand, uh, and developing a plan based on a proof of concept like I did here, and that's the key to success. So thanks again for your time. Um, if you have any questions, I'd, I'd love to hear them. There, there is a question from someone on the uh, on the call. Are there any architecture specific dependencies on Bifrost, or does it work on ARM sixty four? So really, you're going to be limited to whatever Ironic supports, because Bifrost itself is simply uh, playbooks and automation around leveraging a a very compact Ironic deployment. So if you have bare metal images that support ARM sixty four and you know the um 
kernel and RAM disk and all the other components necessary to actually bootstrap a, a bare metal node, support ARM64, then I don't see why that would be a problem. So I think someone asked that question at the one of the open for summit maybe a year ago. And community, uh, the Iranian community, they don't focus too much on the on the ARM architecture. But there was some voices from the from the group, I remember, stating that it just works out of the box. Like it's not really tested or you know, by vendor or you know, by any kind of institution, but uh, Again, so, so someone mentioned, I think there was a person from Australia, I think it was Red Hat too. He said they they had a use case for, for validating ARM and they were able to do it. It just works with the regular ironic bit, but since Firecraft is just using the ironic bits, I don't see how this would be able to do it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, I forget now if the. Um, Bifrost playbooks download, you know, ironic packages for that particular operating system, or if it's actually compiling from source, I, I can't recall offhand. I suspect it's probably pulling devs and RPMs. So your Bifrost host, I don't think there's any reliance on that being an ARM64 box, but certainly the images that you want to deploy in the kernel RAM disk would need to support the ARM architecture. So I have a question for you, James. So since you're talking about like these distributed architectures, right? Like where, uh, where you have, uh, you know, some ironic boxes in Dallas and the other ones in the other part of the country. Where do you store all of these images for, for the ironic? Do you distribute them as well? Or is it, uh, I mean, you might have mentioned that and I, maybe I missed it, but. Yeah, are sorry if I, if they are. So uh, not so an object storage, right. So um, the Rackspace Cloud Files uh, is like a public ob object storage uh, service. And so that has some built-in CDN functionality. I don't know if it automatically distributes those images across you know, the various sites based on user demand, or um, it's not certainly something I had to do manually, but you know, if I were deploying bare metal nodes in other regions of the world, then it would certainly behoove me to to have those images a little bit closer to uh, those sites. And for every node that you define in the inventory, you can be specific with the image location. So if I know I'm deploying against a bunch of nodes in Hong Kong, well, for those particular nodes, I'm going to specify uh, a location that's a little bit more localized. In the U.S., you know, I could have all of my images hosted in, in Virginia and, and Dallas and, and Chicago wouldn't really mind too much. But I could see that being a problem somewhere else. I've got a question about your choice of IPsec as the tunneling, tunneling protocol for, for that demo and potential alternatives. Um, for example, I understand that the way you set this up with the DHCP borders, so only or unicast gets forwarded across that IPsec tunnel, which makes it pretty simple. You could probably use any other tunneling technology in place of uh, IPsec as well. But if we compare that to some kind of a layer two tunneling, um, you know, pros and cons, what's your thought? Like, uh, what guided the decision to pick IPsec? Yeah, so I'll tell you, the, the decision to use IPsec was based on just prior experience and configuring, especially like the Cisco ASA. You know, I used to live and breathe those devices in, earlier in my career, so uh, it became just familiarity, right, um, and a fairly simple configuration on the side of the ASA. I think I spent, you know, a few hours trying to figure out the DNS mess side of things a lot more time than, than the ASA side of things. So. That, that's really it. I, I don't see why this wouldn't, this type of solution wouldn't be uh, solvable with another tunneling protocol or, or another strategy. Just for me, the, this was the quickest path to success. Basically, any tunnel that can forward unicast traffic, layer three, will do for this use case. I would think so, yeah. And we, you know, for our remote deployments, a Cisco ASA or a a firepower running ASA code is, is a pretty standard uh, part of the of our bill of materials. So, you know, if this was another uh, edge device like a Palo Alto firewall or something, the strategy might look a little different. But um, for our deployments, IPsec is a pretty standard component. Yeah, 
Well, another question about the two network interfaces on, uh, I think it was Chicago where the Bifrost VM was living. You had two NICs there, one for external access and the other one was for responding to the DHCP requests. Any reason you couldn't handle that on the ASA using a split tunnel? Uh, so yeah, I did dual home that Bifrost VM and, uh, looking back that, that could have been just a single interface. Um, right. yeah, there, there's no real technical reason why it, why it wasn't. Um, and the reason now escapes me. Right. Um, I think I mentioned earlier in the slides that, you know, once I get it working, I tend to move on without questioning those decisions too much. Um, but you know, if I were to, to redesign this uh for a more production use case then certainly um streamlining that i think would would be in my best interest yeah i guess it wasn't there like an extra playbook you run at the end who set that set up the but i was on the other side i was on the bare metal side right right so you know as uh with with the dual homing of that bifrost vm like you mentioned i have to add static routes uh to get right. back out that interface yeah and Certainly with one interface, I wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. And uh, moving forward, it may just be a good idea to eliminate that step. Yep. It opens up possibility for asymmetric routing without, I think, without the yeah. for it. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's really not a, a necessary thing anymore. Um, and that might have just been on me initially, you know, anticipating some additional difficulties that never manifested, right? And, and it works the way it is. So don't touch it. it ain't yeah, broken. exactly. It's not broken. Yeah. So, go ahead. Okay. No, I, you guys go first. Yeah. I was going to ask um, does, does Bifrost have some kind of support for uh, multi conductor for scalability? My understanding of ironic is that the way you scale um, nodes is by to increase the conductors. Each conductor is responsible for pulling the IPMIs and making sure the nodes are up in the state that they're in. The more if Bifrost supports that that model, if you can you know scale out horizontally. I mean, probably not in its current form. It seems to be uh, written specifically to kind of assist in bootstrapping a you know a limited number of nodes um, to to then deploy a full blown ironic setup, right? That would then be used to uh, to do the rest. So. I don't get the feeling that that's kind of a use case that's really asked for, especially if we look at the playbooks and they've got um, things prescribed to local host. You know, it doesn't really seem to want to fit that multi conductor model. Okay. So you want to scale it by using multiple Bifrost nodes, something in that manner? Yeah, probably not. You know, maybe, maybe if this became something that was, um, you know, with you can set up a Bifrost environment in under five minutes. Um, if you were going to use an ironic based system in, in a similar model, then maybe you set up uh, a full blown ironic deployment with with all the other bells and whistles, and then you get the scalability. Sure, sure. One other question for you: Does Bifrost or if you look into um, ironic capability to do K exec, so you can skip the reboots after the image is deployed? So there's a feature in ironic allows you to do that so you don't have to reboot every bare metal node a second time you can k exec into the new kernel that's been written the disk uh, so it saves you the reboot time and that scale that you can save you a ton of time yeah that's a good question um you're talking the reboot after the deployment or the reboot like after yes. a clean okay yes so after it you can k exec to the, the kernel that's on the new the mm. new just been written i, I, you know, I don't know feature. I would think so. I mean, I think kind of whatever's available to Ironic from a conductor and API standpoint is probably true. It just comes down to your ability to toggle that and turn it on or off. Um, not, I don't think everything is exposed via an Ansible override, but if you, you know, you could make it so, right? Yeah, sure. Sorry, I have no experience with Bifrost, but I've previously deployed Ironic for about a thousand node APC cluster. Group, so looking at the scalability mm -hmm. factors, then. And that was way back in like it's helo era, so it's been quite some time. Yeah, I mean, if that's if that's a just a setting in the in the conductor parameters, then then it might be worth trying. I know that whenever uh, a node is cleaned, you know, it'll it'll hang out right and await uh, further instructions, whether that's a the the deploy command or whatever that happens to be. 
um, inspection will actually reboot the node into the inspection kernel and then do its thing and reboot after that. But yeah, nice. I, I'm curious to try that out. Thank you. Oh, that's yeah, thank good you. to ask a question to you about the scalability. I think the rule of thumb we see with our customers is like one conductor per 200 uh, bare metal hose, right? And if you only have one bifros node, then I don't know. Like, have you have you done any scalability at all with the with the, the bifros? Not with not with this bifros setup. No, it's really just uh, meeting that use case of like I don't have any localized uh, kick system in place, and so how do I quickly at least spin up a handful of nodes to then maybe build a little bit more robust setup that can then do the rest and i think that's where it's targeted like when i mentioned you know bootstrapping the node that bootstraps the nodes i think that's the use the primary use case because otherwise i mean if you get into you know all of the other ironic things and i don't know how how much dependency there is on on nova or keystone even with a more scalable ironic you know architecture but Oh, it'd be worth worth testing out. Because you don't have a load balancer always. either, right? Yeah, there's. I guess there is in GenX, but yeah, there's probably a bit more work to do to, to figure that out. Sorry. No, that's cool. Just, just speaking, I mean, from uh, the latest version I got to was Okada when I still ran Ironic, but one of the biggest scalability issues was the way it pulled up IPMI was serially. So if you had to wait for you know a thousand nodes, it, it would take fifteen minutes to pull like every single IPMI process that to get responses. So yeah, and so mm -hmm. I don't know if it's still a good thing or no, parallelize so they that. They have this thing called conductor groups these days. I don't know if you've tried those, like where yeah. you can assign a block of very little nodes to specific erotic nodes. You can kind of distribute the load. Okay. Is that still handled by the conductor level? Yeah, that, I think so. It will be for the conductor level, but. It's like we have the we have the option. It's like we see some of the big erotic users like CERN using it, uh, where they where they have you know like a bunch of conductors and they assign two hundred compute like bare metal node to one of the conductors and then they just go or it, for the for the HA they're kind of mixing all the matching. But they, there, there's there's some ways there right now in the ironic to, to like, Yeah, and I think that will super. actually uh yeah, doesn't the failover of that work where it moves them to another conductor and then it preempts when that conductor returns? Something like that. Yep. Right. Yeah. All right. I think we're at the top of the hour. Uh, one more question. I yeah, one real quick. Uh, in your example, AJ, thanks. Uh, in your example, <laughs> uh, the storage nodes that you set up, uh, you mentioned that it had disks per set to use. Are those uh, local disks? Are they attached storage or does it? Really no, so this is like a this is a G9. I think it has 12 three and a half inch slots. And so, you know, there's a RAID controller. And so the RAID, two two disks in a RAID 10, and then the rest are in a RAID zero because of the limitations of the, the RAID controller itself. It's not the ideal Ceph storage node, um, but everything's it's all integrated into a 2U chassis. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, James. I uh, appreciate your time. It was a great presentation.